All right, welcome back, everybody. It is one o'clock, and I hope you had uh, a nice lunch and an opportunity to uh, network and, and uh, talk to, to colleagues um, during this lunch hour. Now we're going to turn our attention to how algorithmic management affects uh, people. What does it do to a person to constantly be watched to have an earpiece with a voice telling you what to do in each and every move, and not to have any sense of the ability to influence your work situation and environment. To talk about the Swedish approach to the tech revolution and what is happening on the work floor, I would like to welcome firstly Jenny Rangborg from that is previously now with the Transport Workers uh, Association, but you wrote the study that we're going to um, uh, get a summary of when you were at, at Handels uh, to talk about man-machine work and uh, give us an introduction of this. So, and then we'll welcome a panel and have uh, further discussions. So, very welcome to you, Janne. Imagine a work day where every step you take is dictated by a computer voice. For each work task you must perform, there is a computer that tells you in which order you should do the work and measures every movement. That's the reality for many warehouse workers. A survey we conducted at Handels shows that over a third of our warehouse workers members uh, uh, work with a pick by voice uh, picking system at their workplace. Pick by voice, which, which is just one of a number of technical solutions that is uh, run by algorithms, means that order pick pickers in warehouses use a headset with a microphone to receive voice commands about where to go, which good to pick, and which pallet or cage to put them on. The order picker responds with short voice commands and then has the next item read out to them by the computer, which logs every step of the way. As you can hear, we're talking about strongly controlled work, where the employees have little to none uh, opportunity to influence in what order or how the work should be performed. Where the knowledge of how to best plan the picking route previously laid with the employees, now it has moved into the computer which the employers have control over and can reprogram. The digital systems and algorithms provide the opportunity for extensive data collection. And in our reports, we show a number of problems with how new technical systems are introduced and used, largely linked to systems programmed without consideration of work environments and breaks. I can give you an example. One big employer used the pick by voice system to induce, introduce something they called active time. The system is based on every minute being measured and recorded in 180 second sequences. If you haven't completed any process in three minutes, you will be registered as inactive. If you go to the toilet for more than three minutes, you will be registered as inactive. If you take off your headphones and talk to a colleague and you don't get to the next good within three minutes, you will be registered as inactive. So it's not enough to work fast. You also have to work precisely all the time to pre keep the process going. Pick an item, complete the palette. The group managers then receive individual reports uh, on all employees about how much of their working time they were active and inactive, and they are invited to performance meetings to talk about their productivity based on these numbers. And even though the systems are not allowed to be used to monitor in real time, almost one third state that this happens. 
and the techn technological opportunity to do so exists and managers can come out on the work, work floor and question people about where they were between different times when the system didn't log any activity. We can see that new technology is often introduced without sufficiently uh, involving uh, the workers and workers' representatives. This in turn risks leading to work environment issues not being considered and therefore new problems ar arising. This includes risk of stress, risk of surveillance, reduced social contacts and highly controlled work where members say that they feel like an extension of the computer program that just follow these orders. Four out of ten state that new technology, new technology reduces their influence over how work should be carried out. The same percentage state that monitoring has a negative impact on the workload, which is no surprise when the technology provides the conditions for constant evaluation on the individual work performance. This in contrast to where the whole work group were, were t previously uh, evaluated together as a whole. At a workplace we visited, the union representatives stated that the transition to pick by voice meant that uh, the employees do 16% more picking than with the previous system which means that employees lift up to 1.5 tons more every day. The increase in workload and performance measuring also risk leading to reduced social contact between coworkers. In terms uh, of pick by voice, you also have the physical hindrance of talking to each other since the computer uh, might think that you are responding to commands when you try to talk to your coworker. Systems that make it difficult for employees to talk to each other risk worsening the work environment, uh, but it also risks making union work more difficult. Digital systems that involve just following orders uh, also risk making employees easily replaceable. Warehouse employees state that the logging of picking speed creates a, a culture that does not reward employees to help each other out. Instead, it means focusing on the individual measures uh, and not things that also needs to be done, like uh, helping a coworker, cleaning the aisles, or collectively trying to solve problems that occur. Because the picking system can be programmed in different ways, the use varies in different workplaces. How they are perceived and um, used, how, <laughs> How they are perceived by the employees is dependent on how they are introduced and used in that workplace and whether employees are involved and informed about the systems and how they are used. Uh, in some workplaces it is misused as I have described, but in others local unions have gained access to the collected data and with this have been able to argue for more permanent positions. So it's not black and white, but we need strong unions to be able to, to um, regulate this as we've been talking about today. In terms of active time, the local union made sure that this measurement was not uh, used anymore. But we can only imagine how these systems are used in workplaces where there are no lo local uh, union representatives working with these issues. Uh, a lot of these systems are programmed to automatically log uh, employees as red, orange or green depending on their work pace. So technological development is a two-edged sword. Uh, instrument that might facilitate work can also be tools for surveillance and it will change the nature uh, of the work. So this is not neutral systems that the employers should control or alter without consulting the workforce. And that also includes the reprogramming of the, of the algorithms. We are positive towards investment in new technology, uh, but a prerequisite for this is that employees have influence over and get to share in on the economical gains that come with efficiency, with higher wages, and at the same time does not have to pay with a worse work environment. 
We work to make the employers realize that they need to negotiate these systems with the union and include our representatives in issues of reprogram reprogramming algorithms. But uh, much work uh, remains. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janne. This is what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, this is really what it's all about, what it does to people. Um, I have a few questions before we uh, welcome our panel. And, and you were talking about how real-time surveillance is, in fact, not legal, but it happens anyway through this pick-by-voice um, system. We know that it happens. How is that justified? How is, how is it possible? I think the employer sees this system as neutral. They have bought this system, they have introduced them without sufficiently in involving the local union, and they think that this is my system, I can use it however I want. Uh, and it's for, not until the local union uh, say that this is not okay, that this happens. So they can do it because we're not strong enough, maybe it's the short answer. Hmm. Interesting and, and honest answer. Um, thank you. Um, people you have interviewed in your report say that they feel like robots um, and that they have little or no influence over their work environment. How, how has Handels, because you were with Handels at this time, addressed this as a, as a trade union and how does it affect uh, the negotiations for, for the bargaining agreements? Hannes has started like bigger work, not just with the algorithmic systems, but also the the more advanced system with the uh, automation, where we also have other uh, work environment issues concerning that. But we try to um, educate our representatives in these issues. Like if you are in the local union, you also have a lot of other issues that might seem more pressing uh, at the workplace. But uh, I think we need to. To a higher extent, see this as a as a union question. We need to organize around this. Uh, so that's that's what we're starting to do. I think. Very good. Well, I'd like to ask you to stay uh, on the on the stage, and then we'll welcome uh, the rest of uh, the panel. So we have uh, Victor Bernhard with the Swedish Trade Union Unionen. <laughs> Say that fast three times. Uh, you work with digital markets. Then we have Bertil Rolandsson, associate professor at the Department of Sociology with the Gothenburg University. We have Anna Spont Enbuske, research officer at uh, the Swedish trade union Kommunal. And Fredrik Söderkvist, who's in fact at home today because uh, he's an economist here at LO. <laughs> And I'm going to ask all of you to give a few comments on uh, Jenny's presentation. Maybe I'll come up with uh, you know, a follow-up question. Otherwise, we'll have a discussion afterwards. So, Victor, would you like to start? Thank you, and thanks so much for the great opportunity to address this conference. I mean, there's not much much to say, really, except that this um, uh, what you talk about really illustrates how not to do these things. <laughs> yeah. A very sort of, uh, I could say, pinpointed example of everything that's potentially wrong with introducing algorithmic management. Um, I mean, a, a system that does not encourage workers to be co-workers is simply idiotic thing to do if you want to reach productivity in your business. Uh, set aside uh, sort of the, the human rights <laughs> dimensions of this. To, to sort of translate this to, to where I operate, a union is a, a union organizing white collar workers in the private sector. Uh, you can see that uh, not so much in Sweden, at least not right now, but in Anglo-Saxon um, labor markets, namely the UK, the US, incidentally, where lots of interesting AI systems are also developed. You can see that I was reading this article in um, the British PC mag a couple of years ago. And they had, you know, these magazines have they have tests to be like uh, the best mobile phone to buy in the fall of 2023. And you will have sort of five different phones and they will score them. And they had the, the five best um, 
systems to control your employees. <laughs> <laughs> and a sort of a 12-page sort of guide on which system would fit your your offices depending on uh, what you wanted to be doing. And these systems were, I'm kidding you not, called things like Controlio. So, I mean, we see this we see this emerging. I mean, in the U.S., there is this company that claims that they can measure the feelings of the, of your employees through an AI system. And, uh, of course, you can debate uh, for hours with an AI expert, is this snake oil or is this actually possible? But my issue is that there is a market for this product. Th that's my main concern. Uh, and I think that the market for that product also exists in the European Union, in Sweden, even though we do not develop these systems as much necessarily. So I think what you describe, sort of that's the other dimension uh, of sort of things that I see might be coming around the corner as well for white collar workers. Thank you, uh, Victor. I'm going to uh, stick my neck out here and say, because we've talked about how we need to step up and we haven't been strong enough and, and, and things like that. But I have to say that, that Unionen is an exception to that. You have been in the forefront of this, of this issue in Sweden for a long time. What did you see or why is that? Well, uh, we're not the only ones, surely, but I would say that we're a very large union. Mm. We have 700,000 members currently, uh, so we will have them across uh, a great scope of sectors. We have, so hence we have the interests, but also the resources to be proactive. And at the same time, we operate under a logic in which we see that our members need to work for successful companies. And by doing that, these companies are going to want to embrace new technology. And I mean, that's not something radical to say to others with these unions. This is sort of a consensus, I would say. But that also means that we as a union need to understand this technology. So for us to do both sort of awareness uh, raising for ourselves, but also a policy understanding of whatever new technology comes around is important for us to do, because we need to be able to be, as has been repeated during this conference, proactive in how to address that. Thank you. So you very rapidly came to this con to the conclusion that this is simply idiotic. So that's that's good. Back to you, Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, oh God. I think I should use that. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me. Um, to say or to sort of provide some reflections on your report. Um, you do get concerned when you describe your report the way you do. I have to say, uh, I, I think that you underemphasize some of the opportunities that you also point you out. Please in. speak into the microphone. I'll here. do my best. <laughs> okay. Face the okay. No, but I think you underemphasized some of the opportunities uh, with this type of technological development as well, uh, that we're facing at the moment. And I think uh, reading your text, um, I couldn't help reflecting on uh, some sort of uh, continuity in the way you reason when it comes to digital technologies. We sort of expect this to be a disruptive technology, but the way you describe this development is pretty much in line with how we describe this type of development for ages now. Uh, there is some sort of act of balance between concerns when it comes to technological development, digital development, if you'd like, at the same time as there are opportunities for upgrading. And this type of, of logic is something that has uh, guided uh, the discussion for decades, I would say. It's been important for... Um, the unions in collective bargaining for ages, in particular in the Nordics. And uh, um, the logic that sort of guides this is pretty sort of uh, straightforward as well. We recognize it. It's about getting rid of the bad jobs. It's about increasing efficiency so we can ensure the employment. It's about gaining some sort of growth so we have space for salaries. But perhaps also, uh, in particular, if we're supposed to move closer to work, um, the way we practice work, it's about the work environment, how we get rid of bad tasks that sort of impoverish our life situation. And the interesting thing about this logic is that it is 
pretty much in engaged with our life situation generally. It's about our general welfare, if you like. At the same time, it is a, a taken for granted assumption about what happens to content of work, which I think we have to move closer to and actually investigate. It's not just about our life situation, it's also about the contents of the work that we actually engage with. It's not about improving our life situation solely, it's also about improving our work practices somehow. And it's taken for granted when it comes to digitalization that it becomes better if it becomes more, uh, we we'll say, engaged with or draws on, on uh, uh, cognitive tasks, if you like. It becomes knowledge intensive. Hence, it's better somehow. Something I think is important, and I think in order to sort of get closer to what you're actually, the concerns you have, is that we start to not just take this assumption for granted, but also try to investigate what type of cognitive tasks are we actually uh, identifying when we do these type of changes. This type of act of balance when we sort of assume that there is a possible upgrade incoming um, are pretty occupied with the tasks that disappears. We rationalize work, different tasks are disappearing. And don't actually investigate, I would say, the new tasks that are coming. And why on earth they are good or bad. So I would, I would call for more engagement, more, uh, we say, studies on the actual type of uh, uh, cognitive tasks that are emerging when we introduce new digital means. Uh, I know from own experiences doing studies how new digitalized assembly lines uh, sort of improves uh, the work environment, the physical work environment. But at the same time, a lot of uh, uh, the staff in those cases have started to suffer from new types of work environment problems. Uh, more the type of work environment problems we associate with white collar work, perhaps. And we do not address these challenges as good as we do or as good as we should, <laughs> if we just stick to this classic logic where digitalization is primarily analyzed as something that we say uh, make us able to get rid of tasks. We also have to investigate how it actually foster new tasks. That is my reflection on this. Thank you very much uh, for that, and we'll we'll come back to you with with more questions. We we talked about a few aspects out there, such as you know new tasks and and uh, and positive aspects of digitalization. We talked about HR functions, for instance, and and but we'll get back to that uh, uh, later. Anna Spont Ebuske from Kommunal. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you very much for an interesting conference and an interesting report. I gladly read it, and thank you for the, uh, giving me or and Kommunal the opportunity to, to talk about our members' experiences. Um, according to uh, the introduction of new technologies at the workplaces within the welfare sector, so we represent uh, about 80%, oh, we represent pink color workers, if you see what I mean. So I will uh, try to give you an idea about the, what kind of impact new technologies like automation, ICT, and maybe the lack of assistive technologies with digital function has had on our workers' uh, ex methods and experiences at the workplaces. So for the last five years, we have presented reports according, after conducting several surveys and program and projects and you can find them on our uh, website. And for example, in February 2020, we conducted a member survey uh, focusing on the impact of new technologies. And our findings are published in two reports. And we, we had the ability to compare our results with 
the result from two of our sisters' trade union organizations. One was, the first one was Fagforbundet in Norway, and the Tankesmedian Agenda actually conducted that survey. And then we had opportunity to con compare some questions and answers with Junus in the UK, and actually University of Exeter conducted that survey. So I've talk, talked to researchers in, and um, um, yeah, researchers, officers, and professors of both organizations. And since Handels used some of the same questions as we have had in our surveys, I'm taking the opportunity to compare our results. So the commerce and the private sector services and the welfare sector. So um, I had to make assumptions about what Jenny was going to talk about. So she has actually not talked about everything I thought she was going to talk about. So you have to have use your imagination. So I'm going to talk first talk about some similarities. Okay. And also to Sarmak, I've act, uh, a year ago I gave a presentation or two presentations in South Korea. And I was, what does a trade union research officer is doing talking about in Korea and talking about researchers of the digitalization out of a um, worker's perspective? And I, I gave them the link to the Nordic models for dummies from Samak. I thought it was excellent how we cooperate. In, within the Nordic countries. Why should we cooperate? And this is an example for that too. So when it comes to new technologies, uh, they do change work tasks at the office. It's nothing new. Just look back and say. It's, it's common. And it's just, uh, it's, it's even more, um, uh, compared to Handels, new, te no, new technology has changed more among the work tasks when than compared to our members in, in the welfare sector. But and also new technologies increase the stress levels, so they don't reduce it. And we have very high sick leaves in the welfare sector, so this is a huge problem. And it's more problematic in, when, among our members than according to your survey, the results. And we are all there, the all workers, it doesn't matter with the, in the private or public services, we are very interested in learning more skills. But anyway, our members, they lack the good structures. And also, um, unfortunately, the health and safety inspectors and organization lacks influence and uh, risk assessments before introducing new technologies. Differences. Um, the digital uh, solutions, they have not reduced the heavy lifting within our sector. They have not been the exoskeletons and so on. There's still very much physical power used. And that this is also less um, impact than in the at Handels survey, I think. And also, and it's very difficult to uh, digitalize the face-to-face -face work that our members use, uh, actually perform every day. And we have um, the users, the citizens, they are all over the country, and we, have, we work 24-7, and we also need support for our digital systems 24-7. And the, it's not easy to reallocate the elderly, because they're actually living in their homes, most of them. So, if I'm taking to, talking too much now, then it's come... Oh, no, fine. okay. <laughs> I'm cutting down here. Uh, yes, when it comes to, uh, there are some similar, when, when we look at the future, we have great, ex our members have great expectations for the future because they're used to change. And also we have a Nordic system where it's free, education is free. And we have um, stimulations for lifelong learning. And we have agreement between this, with the government and the social partners of how to improve and get access to this. So when it's similar, and we have a similar situation with this Fagforbundet and Kommunal, our members. But when it comes to the future, and with the members in the unison, they're very disappointed. They have a situation in the public sector with short, uh, harsh austerity experiences and short time work or um, short contracts and so on. And also in the public sector.
But then you have an update, and then you just uh, tw twerk or tweak to tweak a little bit. You change something, and then it's uh, you can uh, you can actually follow them. You, you yeah, it turns into something else. Okay. And this our second question was what I forgot that. Well, the question was how it how it affects the people your members work with and, and of the course, dangers. It, it's, it's very dangerous. Yeah. So I think you kind of answered that in, in your, your, yeah. your question. Thank you. Fredrik Söderqvist, hello. Thank you. So uh, hello, everyone, uh, and especially welcome to our guests from abroad. Uh, you've heard some really depressing examples of <laughs> how technology is being used to exploit workers in Sweden. Uh, and <clears throat> if you ever meet Swedes in international places like Brussels, for example, uh, maybe you're wondering why we are so skeptical towards uh, federal regulation of these technologies when things are going so badly here. Well, the thing is, things are going well in some places. So there are causes for optimism. But in order, before I get there, I just want to say really briefly, that in, in this building there were two gentlemen in the 1950s who wrote a report to the 1951 Congress of the LO. Uh, their names were Josta and Rudolf Meidner. And uh, they formalized ideas in the labor movement at the time that were very much pro-technology. The idea in the Swedish labor movement was that productivity is a necessity if we're going to have a welfare state. So industry should rationalize. We should get rid of the old, dirty, demeaning, dangerous and dull jobs for example, in agriculture, and instead then help people transition to industries that can support high wages and high standards of living. Uh, being an LO economist myself, when we summarize this, um, what we can essentially say is that technological development and progress has its conditions. So the fact that we're positive towards this, three conditions have to be met. The first is security and transition. So if you are faced with technological unemployment, there should be security in the labor market, not necessarily in the individual job. There should be a fair share of the gains and costs. And third, the new jobs should be better than the old. Currently, in a lot of member associations of the LO, that is not the case. Jobs are becoming worse, and employers are using technology to make it so. How is that? So as an economist, we tend to think that technology is something that we equate with productivity. That's uh, a position that is being challenged. Uh, everyone should read Pro Power and Progress by Daron Asimoglu and Simon Johnson. I just told everyone I've had coffee with here. <laughs> but they make a really strong case around this assumption in mainstream economics that technology equals productivity. So Daron Asimoglu is, I think, the most quoted living economist or something like that. But he's launched a theory that's called So-So Technologies. Uh, and the idea with so-so technologies is that, no, technology does not necessarily mean productivity increases. Similarly, Erik Brynjolfsson, who is one of the people who started the hype around these discussions that we're having today, uh, wrote a paper before Christmas showing concern that if AI is only used to automate human tasks and not look sufficiently at how AI can augment human capacities, we are in for a bad position, where the technology owners will get all the shares and productivity will stagnate. So when we talk about, you know, this, they, as Moglu and Johnson talk about a productivity bandwagon, the automatic idea that technological progress is something that everyone benefits from. Well, they look historically and say that, well, that's actually something that happened in the 20th century mainly. Uh, and why was that? Well, two factors come up. One, in some countries, labor was in very short supply. So entrepreneurs were forced to develop technologies that combined man and machine to produce more output. But also organized labor was really important. And this is super exciting coming from a mainstream economist recognizing that voice is an important part and aspect of technological development and productivity increases. So, and then I will come back then to the positive example. So, uh, having spent a lot of years looking into the gig platform economy and being, you know, saying the Swedish model will handle this and being frustrated that uh, it's, it's not a paradise by any means, we decided that, well, what do almost identical technologies look like when they're implemented in a work site where we have possibly the strongest union local chapters in the country? So, we decided to look at the mining industry. Uh, the mining industry is rapidly being automated. 
uh, and it's partially driven by Swedish mining equipment suppliers, Sandvik, Atlas Copco, Epiroc they're called now, ABB, Ericsson. They're all developing technologies to automate mining machineries underground in Sweden with in cooperation with Swedish mining companies. So what does that mean? Well, it means you install Wi-Fi in the mines, essentially, and that means that you can transmit data, which is important when you have robots running around, but it also means that you can position machines. That also implies you can position workers in the same way that you do in a warehouse or that you do for a bicycle courier. So what happened at this company? Well, in the first interview, one of the employers said, uh, yeah, we could use this technology to micromanage them, but why the hell would we want to turn our miners into bio-robots? These mines, some of the mines that we study are the most productive mines in the world when it comes to actual labor productivity. They produce the most ore per man hour in their respective categories of mining, you know, the, the techniques they use to, to excavate ore from the earth. And so why does the employer here have this different attitude compared to employers in warehousing, for example? So we probe that and, you know, we come into the idea of trust. The union is involved from a very, from the earliest possible phase when they talk about how we're going to automate our mining operations. They agree that it's important that we have productivity increases. They both agree that safety is a very good way to use technology to improve safety in the mine. So if you can position where every miner is all the time in the mine, it's a significant improvement to before, because when there's an accident before, you just knew who was in the mine. You had no idea where they were in 100 kilometers of tunnel or something like that. Whereas now you know exactly who is in the rescue chamber and who is not. But in that discussion, in the co-determination process that followed, there were concerns about, will you monitor our bathroom breaks? Or will you use the data where we are in the mine to set our wages? And the employer said, no, we will on anonymize the screens where you see where everyone is. And we will only use this data. They will be de-anonymized if there's an accident or we need to look up afterwards if there was something criminal that happened. But when it comes down to the employer, I mean, what is this? Well, they have a very Swedish view of, of, of their, the, the miners in, in this place, I'd say. They believe that, you know, they will develop technology. The, the miners themselves help develop the technologies that, they, that the mining suppliers come there and test. They do a lot of piloting and testing before they implement things full scale. But the idea here is that the most important asset to the organization are the workers. And that's something all HR departments are supposed to say, but when they implement systems like this, that's clearly not what they actually think. So then we asked, okay, trust, fine. We can trust that the union will be constructive, that they will come up with good ideas, help the technology be better. It'll help implementation, because people will actually use the equipment the way it is supposed to be done. Uh, in in Anglo-Saxon countries, that's often a problem when you have new technologies that you can't really control miners when they are in, in a mine, so they won't use it. So they will have higher degree of adaptation. But the other thing when we asked, but okay, trust. Well, to me, I, I'm, I'm new in, in academia. Um, what, 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 so what, what does a loss of trust mean in this case? Uh, and what, all the employers answered immediately was, oh no, we won't get any night shifts. <laughs> The unions own the night shifts. We have to buy them continuously. So in this case, what we found is that the trust of the miners' unions and the white-collar unions, it's actually, it has a monetary value. It has a social value to the employer as well. But in a lot of sectors, Swedish co-determination, the employer has employer prerogative unless they do something illegal. But it means that the union is a consultory partner. The union's opinion can be different valuable. The miners' opinion is super valuable in this country. The warehouse workers' opinion when it comes to this technology isn't worth very much. So it, the, the model works if there is some kind of bargaining asymmetry locally, and I think this is what we need to look into uh, much more closely if we want to understand why are some sectors doing worse than others. And it is my personal opinion that the sectors who do this kind of excessive automation, they will not see the productivity increases that we see in the mining industry or other industries where we have really strong unions and that also coincidentally have a strong and good and solid relationship with their employer counterparties. So, sorry if I spoke too long. No, 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 no absolutely not. Uh, so, as you say, I mean, this is a matter of trust and, and attitude. How do we regulate trust? Well, uh, you, you make uh, trust valuable. I mean, the Swedish saying with the co-determination, the working place, the co-determination in the workplace act, uh, w when someone wants to say that regulation is useless, they call it to 
to our English, uh, it means you, the employer has to honk and drive. They, can, they only have to honk before they drive. So if the union wants to get out of the way, fine, or else they'll be run over. Uh, that happens more in some sectors of the economy than others. And I'm quite convinced that in the sectors of the economy where the trust of the unions is essential to, ec to economic operations, they won't do that as often because it'll cost the employer. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's pretty basic human thing. It's really hard for us to, be, to put ourselves into somebody's shoes, but we're more likely to do it if, it, if, if it's going to cost you something not to do it, right? right. I mean, yeah. Right. Well, thank you all very much for, for interesting comments. I will open the floor for questions, otherwise I have a whole battery full of questions. But I'm sure you have questions as well. Come on, this is people we're talking about. Hi, thanks so much for the interesting presentations. I'm Theo Cox, also from Demos Helsinki. And picking up on your point of making trust valuable, I think that's a really interesting sort of encapsulation. I wonder how you view doing that in context, be they in industries or be they in countries such as the UK where unions are massively, massively depowered and there is kind of lack of mobilization. How do you make trust valuable in context where you've much success has been achieved without that kind of trust being valuable? So as you say, the mining is a, a quite unique context where work, workers have a lot of power. In context of disempowerment, how do we make trust valuable again? Can I do that? <laughs> So, uh, getting back to uh, EU issues that we are very vexed about here, uh, one thing that gives the Metal Workers Union in this particular case strong is the fact that the Swedish Working Time Act is garbage. Uh, and um, it doesn't allow night shifts. So the employers are forced to buy flexibility at sectoral bargaining level. The sectoral bargaining agreement in this case is also garbage, <laughs> which means that the employer has to buy flexibility in both steps. But what it does is that it allocates the most valuable asset of flexibility to the employer at the local level. So that's an example of how you can use, we call it derogatory uh, legislation in Sweden. But how it's set up within a system can actually endow uh, the local union with something to sell. And having something to sell to the employer is, you know, good. Um, that's just w one example. I'm sure there are many interesting... Anybody else want to comment on that question? Victor? I mean, one key component, obviously, is organizational uh, level. Like, you, you will not be able to bargain with your strong bargaining ships if you don't have strong representation nationally and locally. I think that that's a prerequisite to anything that you want to have happen, uh, more or less. So, and, and that's sort of, that's not an easy solution, of course. But I mean, my organization, we invested um, over a decade, a lot of resources and time into expanding our membership base. Uh, and we've done so. Uh, we went from, I think, 408,000 members to 700,000 in, in a decade, which is uh, a large gain. And it has given us uh, a stronger bargaining position, also in the weaker contexts uh, in which we don't have as much um, let's say, as much to bargain with as the miners would have, for example. Because since we are such a broad organization, we have everything from, you know, telephone salespeople to, you know, high-level engineers and data scientists. And um, the collective makes that, that strength uh, possible. Then, of course, you would have to adapt to whichever local context you are within. I don't think there's like a one-size-fits-all <coughs> thing here. Not quite the contrary, but organization without that it's going to be hard Anna first then Jenny in the public uh, sphere we have a different challenge we need the politicians to accept the the bottom up uh, perspective so and to share power between elections or over elections because we have a we have to have a, a progress so we have a, have a plan on several years, because this takes time. And we also need to have all different kinds of professionals on board, because they have to share power with uh, the all kinds of professionals. And we need also, when within welfare services, with the elderly or the citizens, if they're just students, the parents, the elderly and their relatives, what kind of problems should be solved? 
and prioritized. And so it's the share of power. Yeah, and connected to that, we've been talking a bit about uh, the need of EU le legislation in this area, but I think we also need to see that the power imbalance is also about, like here in Sweden, it's allowed to employ in very short contracts. Like we need to look at the whole play, playing field here and not just this technical thing, because if we want to change how technical uh, systems are being used in the workplace, it also depends on uh, the power balance overall. And it, like having very short contract makes it very hard to organize in, in some sectors. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I can have some reflections as well when it comes to trust. Uh, you can talk about different types of trusts, obviously, but um, I would say that time makes it valuable. Uh, you choose trust because you do not see any other option, usually. It's too costful to do the alternative. And that's why you sort of end up having to rely on the other, even if you don't you cannot be sure whether they are actually going to bring their part to the bargain, if you understand what I mean. Uh, but as time goes by, you maintain trust and you understand what is, at, what is at stake and it becomes valuable. So I think if you're supposed to understand trust, you have to have a time perspective. Mm. You don't just set up valuable trust, you gain it. Thank you. I think... And I wanted to come in with a final comment, then we move on to that. It's also about know-how and knowledge, like the mining industry and your papers and your research. They show that you gain power and gain trust by sharing information yeah. and learning together. Um, the opposite is true in, within on the Swedish municipalities, how they work. They want to be number one. Everyone wants to be. And unfortunately, they don't, they don't use the sandboxes. They don't use lakes. They don't try and test. They actually buy and try on our on the citizens and our members <coughs> directly. And that's quite scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's quite scary. Mm. Talk about risks. Yes, next yeah. question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jürgen Karin from uh, Fellesforbundet. We are Norway's uh, largest private sector union, and we organize blue-collar workers in, in, in both industry and, uh, and more services like transport and hotel and restaurants. And the, the Nordic model or, or the trust is, is very different between these sectors, and there is a very strong uh, symmetry between, between uh, the trust and the power that we have. So, I mean, in my, I mean, trust also stems from power because you respect uh, the partner that has power uh, and you, through cooperation, build, uh, build that kind of trust that, that we are talking about. Here. And this is important because my, my question is on wh from where does these techno technologies come? Where is it developed under which mindset and and when i speak to the local shop steward they very often tell me how they are training their managers because their managers have read american management literature uh, and they don't necessarily know how it is working on a norwegian workplace so it takes a long time and some conflicts confrontations and then my representatives then tell me how they train these managers into these, our cooperation model. And obviously, the, the, the story that Jenny told uh, at the start, that's something that I would guess is made up in, in China or in America, where uh, a worker is not a human being, but some kind of asset that you should use as possible as everything. So my, my point is that, I mean, the, the more we, we move into this, the better because then we can shape it as we like it, as we find it valuable in, in the Nordic countries. So, so how, how, what is your perspective on who and where this is going to be developed? Who, who would like to go for it? Yeah, there is. 
I can ju just talk about how these systems come from the states often and they're pro programmed there and this automatically logging of uh, red, orange, green, they're, they're in the system from the start. The, the employer doesn't necessarily know it, but when they find out uh, and it's not reg regulated, they are very keen on using it because it's, it's there and it should be okay then maybe. Uh, but uh, we need to uh, know that as a union as well, that this is problems that might occur with these systems and regulate them from the start and be uh, in that process from the start. Because uh, that's all, in this uh, bad example, we were not. And that's why things like this happen. But the example with uh, where the union got got this uh, collected data and could use it for more permanent positions and like use it for the... Uh, there, the union was very strong, almost 100% uh, uh, were members, and then there is that trust, because it has to be there, that, that's all of you talked about. So. Thank you. Victor? I mean, to, to start where you finished off, uh, we see the implementation of these digital uh, algorithmic management systems as clearly falling underneath the Swedish Co-Determination Act, hence they should be co-determined before they implemented. Um, but sort of to build on, Another strategy that I would find useful is to see why would an employer want to introduce these systems if we want to sort of give them a benefit or the doubt of there is, is there a productivity gain to be looked for here. And if you're a company, say 10,000, 15,000, 35,000 employees, you can expand your HR department uh, sort of into infinity. You will still not know what your employees are doing at work because there are simply too many. Uh, if you are lucky, you know what they ha their job title and where in the country uh, they are situated and the hours they work and how much they are paid. So if you can use large data, uh, sort of data sets and cognitive computer systems that are sort of more or less sophisticated into gaining a deeper understanding of what your workers do, how they do that, in what ways you need to improve productivity, of course, these systems become interesting. I mean, I, I met an HR department manager at a large Swedish industrial company, and they said, well, Victor, you know, 70% of my work, I just guess, because we do not know. Uh, and if, if, if that's your truth, of course, you're going to want more data. Uh, and I, I, I can sympathize with that, because, uh, I mean, I want this HR department to be proactively taking responsibility for workplace training, for capacity strengthening, etc., etc., because you want to be able to see the, the people in the workplace as true assets to, to grow themselves and grow the company. So I wouldn't say that I am sort of against introducing algorithm management systems per se, because I see there is a lot of potential here. But of course, as has been touched on here and earlier today, it is a political decision what you do with your information. Like you have 5% of your workforce are underperforming sort of the quotas uh, irrespective to the median, okay? You can either say, how do we improve these 5% of people in their work situations? Or you can say, we're not going to pay them as much because they are not performing. Like those are two different paths you can take with the same information. The information here isn't necessarily the problem. Although, of course, having the information brings a new sets of challenges of data integrity and data management and so on and so forth that we could talk about in a coffee break, perhaps. That's what I would do. Thank you. Fredrik. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, it, but it does need to have some level of local flexibility. Um, when it comes to our mining case and the system that was developed to uh, position all the workers in the mine, for example. So first of all, one of the mines chose not to have the anonymization feature. And the reason was, there's a social function. Then I will know where my friend is on my same shift. But uh, it turned out that uh, some employer at some point in time uh, called out on the radio, hey, you are not supposed to be over there. Immediately, the union boss went to that manager and said, that's not how we use this system. And you easily solved that problem. But it required trust, and it required social boundaries that don't need to be regulated in a formal contract all the time. But that's what high trust does. Another thing that's interesting about that system, it was developed uh, by an external company called Mobilaris. Uh, the anonymization feature was something that Boolean paid them to, to make. And that system is now being used in Canada, in Australia, and all other kinds of places. So there's an example of a Swedish system that could allow for algorithmic management that includes social technical solutions that have a distinct Swedish touch to it when it comes to these issues. So yes, I think it's super important to look at this. This is definitely 
uh, Anglo-Saxon views of workers that started to come around there in the 70s and 80s. The managers were implemented, went to business school in the 90s. Uh, I know for a fact that a lot of the business schools in the US now are not teaching that that's a good idea. It's much more focused on good jobs to increase productivity through trust and so on. So if we wait maybe 20 years, the new uh, <laughs> MBA graduates will, will not uh, be so evil. Um. Thank you, uh, Fredrik. And, and now I heard uh, for a fact that you're going to implement the same system at Ello. So we know at any given point <laughs> where everybody is in this huge building. Yeah, see you there. Perfect. Excellent. Last question. Yes, um, just nice to hear Frederick talk about union strength as a, a crucial factor, and uh, just the observation that the one of the sectors with the lowest unionization, <laughs> sorry, uh, is in fact the tech sector. And every time I work with tech companies and lecture them, they are completely unaware of leg legislation about. Um, um, workers having the say in the work workplace and and even the um, occupational safety and hazards uh, regulations they're completely blank they're sort of like what <laughs> there are laws about this or about that so that is I think also uh, to my Norwegian colleague here uh, a comment about uh, the missing part in the uh, development of many tech digital systems yeah, Victor. <laughs> I mean, um, many of our counterparts, uh, or a, lo a large part of these tech companies in Sweden, would be our presumptive, uh, presumptive counterparts. And I could just echo what you say and add to that it doesn't seem to matter if these companies are very small, which is the case for most companies who operate in the so called platform gig economy and are quite small, few employees, or startups essentially, or if they are companies that used to be startups but are now sort of global players. Um, the common denominator is that you identify as a tech company. <laughs> and that's a challenge for us, of course. Uh, but it also means that we don't need to develop, I think, specific strategies for startups or specific strategies for larger tech enterprises. Uh, on the contrary, it falls back to that our existing systems uh, do cover really almost all of this already. I mean, I, I, I see that we need to do some sort of turning the knobs on occupational safety and health regulations in some cases. But other than that, the system as such is super robust to manage all of these problems. It's just a question of we actually needing to manage them. I mean, the Swedish economy has done several successful technology leaps in history, in, in, in labor market specifically. Uh, it's all gone quite well. That's not, a, so of course... Um, uh, doesn't put in stone that's going to happen the next time, but at least I think it shows that the system is capable of managing these shifts. Uh, and through that, uh, it shows us that social partners need to reinvent that process every time because the challenges are going to be particular as well. I think we're doing good, um, and I think uh, sort of it's a better strategy for us rather than try to sort of legislate more in, in hoping that's going to solve the problem because it hasn't been needed previously. Thank you. Just a short comment on that. Um, talking to people in different tech sectors, because I guess you have to say that there are different tech sectors as well. You have this type of, uh, we'll say, um, we'll say uncertainty about which sector you belong to as well. <laughs> uh, and we've been talking about that, haven't we? Um, and that also means that in a lot of cases, they don't even know what union they were supposed to uh, engage with. Uh, and I think there's a, an unclear situation when it comes to that that has to be dealt with as well. And I think the union have some responsibility there. We try. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we will let that conclude the discussion uh, around the tech revolution and the work floor. Uh, seeing as how we are in Sweden, it's naturally time for FICA. Um, that's the, that's the biggest crisis that could ever happen if there's something, some, a hiccup or something. I, I, I uh, moderated the SOMAC meeting about a year ago and I said there's fika outside the door and there was no fika. And people almost went check. home. It was awful, <laughs> awful. Now you make me go check uh, if there's fika. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
So anyway, we reconvene at, at 2.30 uh, and uh, continue our interesting discussions. And thank you very much for coming and participating here today, especially thank you to Yanni for sharing uh, your report. <laughs>